And it, it, is, it is kind of funny, right? But not really. Um, because it's a very hard habit to break. Um, and there, what is absent is the, it's the notion of you have more than one way to solve a problem, and you don't have to use inheritance. And there are specific motivations when you should use inheritance. But even when those are justified, you, you might want to instead use composition. OK, so I call this class fixed, and it derives from a public base. So the name implies that what do you have with the, this inheritance relationship? You've got a fixed overhead. You've got one base component. You, you have one, the one cardinality of one, right? You have the overhead whether you like it or not. Um, that's the minus side. And on the plus side, you have the inheritance of the interface, which promotes extensibility, right? right? OK, if you have a handle, if you uh, instead contain an object, you have a little more flexibility. OK, so here's an alternate. You define a class, and you put in a handle to a base class component, right? So this allows you to over, uh, uh, avoid the overhead. If you want to avoid the overhead, which is zero off the handle, it allows you to have an array of base class objects. And if base class has descendants, it'll give you a little flexibility that you can actually just contain uh, the address of one of the descendants. Uh, so it gives you a whole lot more flexibility. Um, so the contrast between design choices is often absent. So this summarizes some of the uh, important uh, issues you want to talk about. What I feel really must be emphasized is trade-off. Students should really understand how uh, cost benefit. What do I get if I take this approach? What do I lose if I take this approach? What, what can happen in the future if I take this approach? Okay. And, and oftentimes, you know, students' motivation is to get through the course, right? And to get something done. And it's a, there's a pressure to be expedient rather than to um, think long term. And they actually don't have to think long term because, you know, finals come and they're done, right? They're not going to have to look at that software any longer. OK, so talking about interface and language support. Um, overhead, flexibility, um, cardinality, uh, ownership, and the impact on expenses. These are all great topics that you can go to depth if you look at something that involves design alternatives. And I like looking at composition versus inheritance because this is something that um, is, is a practical choice, but it's not, it's not really examined. Um, another big area is interface and expectations. So if I'm looking at comparing X to Y, right, um, this is an easy concept to absorb. Okay. Uh, and if I'm looking at, let me just put it here, X equal to Y, right, that's also a fairly easy concept to absorb. It becomes a little, little, uh, subtle when you're comparing ints versus floats, the whole notion of equality for real numbers, again, if you don't have a computer architecture course, might be missing. Um, but just on the lines of uh, uh, relative evaluation, right, it's important to teach students about expectations from the application of programmers' perspective, where someone's going to be using their software, because most software is large scale you have to program to someone's expectations, not your own. Okay. So obviously, if you can look at uh, x less than y, you should be able to look at y greater than x. Right? And this is fine if x and y are the same type. Right? If you uh, are looking at overloading operators in a class, okay? well, let's say y is a different type. Well, that's fine, you just overload the overloaded operator. But, well, that might not work when you look at the corresponding greater than call, right? Okay. Um, so this is a very interesting topic, and uh, some students find it very frustrating because 
overloading operators is very easy to do syntactically. Deciding what operators to overload so that you have a consistent set um, of operators in your interface is oftentimes very subtle. Okay? Um, and it, you know, again, the difference between quality, strict equal, and strict less than and less than or equal to um, sometimes is also subtle. Okay? And the notion of equivalence again. Uh, has an impact on your design. Mm -hmm. And all of this is, uh, in my experience, given short shift in, in many of the curriculum. Okay. So those are just some common examples that occur uh, in uh, teaching students as they progress through the CS curriculum. I wanted next to talk about personal characteristics that make students successful. Yeah? Well, I, had a, I had a question. I never would have learned C++ if I didn't know a assembly language first, because it just made no sense to me until I looked at what the assembly language was. Um, so has assembly language completely disappeared from CS curriculums, or is it? Is uh, again, it depends upon where you're taking your CS degree and what track you're on. In, in the traditional, more fully fleshed CS degree where you're getting a BS when you're taking lots of credits, it will probably be there. It might be combined in a computer architecture course. If you're taking a minor or you're taking a BA or, or you're taking a business track specialization, it probably won't be there. But but your, your, your point is, is very uh, appropriate because what assembly gives you is a strong understanding of registers and how memory is manipulated, right? And sometimes even the cost of, of making uh, uh, memory access versus versus computation, and that that's not present in just the intro to programming. Well, what a semi language gives me is the you know why the language behaves the way they do, why the compiler behaves the way you do, and if you don't know assembly, it always seems to me like you're trying to do physics without knowing calculus. <laughs> You're just following formulas and rules without understanding what's oh, but happening. You, know, you can do physics without calculus. You just can't do very much physics, right? Well, that's right? What the physics you do is very limited, right? And you, have, you know, many students who graduate don't become software developers, or they become software developers in a very limited sense. So, so it's, it, you have to talk to students and, and discuss what it is they want to do. Uh, if they want to go into um, marketing or management, with an IT concentration, if they want to go into testing, well, actually that's not a good example. They they may not need that that background, but if they're going to go into anything that, that requires an understanding of efficiency or optimization, they should have it. Do you have a question? Yeah. Of the topics that you you address, which one do you spend the most time on in your courses? Uh, I, I probably spend. Well, my students guess that, but I spend a lot of time on memory management. Um, I think it's important that students understand that garbage collection is not a perfect process, that systems that have garbage collection often don't have much control over their performance, and that if you have things that are fragmented deep, you can really have unacceptable performance, even though your code runs correctly. Um, I also think it's important that students understand that uh, good memory management is possible, right? You shouldn't just shrug your shoulders and say, hey, it's too difficult, I'm not going to do it, let's go to Java, right? Um, it's important that students are able to make a choice, right? For this application, I need C, for this application, I need Pro, uh, Python, for this application, I need C, right? You can't make that choice if you're afraid of memory management. You're always going to go to a garbage collected language. I was actually intrigued by your uh, your example of operator overloading. Uh, did you find that the STL simplifies that or obscures it? Uh, I'm thinking of the algorithm header. Yeah, I, I think I think it obscures it uh, because students get too much into the. Uh, 
code duplication aspect of templates rather than the interface, right? And it's the interface and it's the consistency of design that, to me, I want to get them thinking about. Um, and so much of the STL is immediately usable that students don't really think about how they're putting things together. Do you think the, the implicit calls confuse issues? Yes. Or is that an area that you would find to be particularly difficult for people? Understanding implicit. I, I just skim it, right? It was, yeah. It was one lecture today. Right? That's it. Sure. That's right. Um, think, well, to actually use the STL effectively, you have to know a whole lot more than what you're going to learn in the software design course. And I can't turn an upper level software design course into a course on the STL um, because then they wouldn't get some of the other stuff that I like to emphasize that is not in. Courses. So where does it fall? It's, it's, it, it doesn't. It's absent. Um, some places have it, and I, I don't think it's, it, a lot. That's actually a much more hands-on learning. I think it's been relegated to that area, unless you can put it into an elective and have the students take the elective. You run into the same kind of issues in programming languages with the operator over or the various syntactic sugars coming up and confusing people? Um, somewhat, but the programming language course, you, you either traditionally teach it, it's traditionally taught two ways. One is a survey course where you, you run through examples for, you know, this language types this way, this language types this way. Um, Memory is handled this way, it's handled that way. Um, uh, and the alternative is to take a language and use that language, and it's typically a, 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 a non traditional language like Scheme, so they ex explore the functional programming. And you have this, the students that know something like a, a parser. Right? So if you take the latter approach, they're just focused on one language. So that becomes less of the issue. If you take a survey course approach, right, then you're, you're looking at such small snippets of a variety of languages, you don't really get into depth. Right. But I do talk about syntactic sugar. Um, you know, it's, it's important for students to understand when a construct uh, looks nice because of you any more power. Do you think that <coughs> intro courses like at MIT does their intro program course in Scheme? Um, to what extent do you think that kind of that choice uh, impacts sort of concerns that you're, that you're bringing up here? Um, <clears throat> well, you have to realize that different schools work with different student bodies, right? And so the student body at MIT is probably not your average student body. Okay, and um, a lot of schools deal with a wide cross-section of students, both in terms of background, but also in terms of motivation, experience, and maturity. Right? Um, and that constrains what you can do in a CS1 course. If we taught our CS1 course in the scheme, our enrollments would be even lower than they are now. Um, uh, scheme appeals to a lot of people, and it's easy to pick up for a lot of people, but it also is so unlike what most people are used to seeing. Because actually, some, most students come in with some, some programming, uh, but it's a difficult thing to go through. Right? Yeah. Is it hard for them to learn through cursive writing, or is it that it's not like what their friends are doing? Uh, I think it's probably the latter. Did, did you guys take scheme or not? Was it, no, you took that one, okay. We actually um, had Scheme in our programming language course, and we had so many complaints about it, and we lost students at that point that we moved from you know, writing a parser and Scheme to the survey approach, and it's somewhat m modified by we use Python um, for implementation. I, would, I mean, I would guess the most common objection to the Scheme is that well, how do I make GUI? I mean, not you can't, but it's, it's so, somehow less obvious to people, I think, that you can make something that looks like a program that we recognize from our user experience. 
Actually, the most common objection we got was, what am I going to do with this? Yeah, so no one is looking for a scheme program. Or I don't want to waste my time learning this. Right? And um, you know, when almost all of your graduates go into industry, very few go into graduate school, it's really hard to maintain a course that there's all these objections to. That's not to say that it's not valid. It certainly is valid. It's just that in some situations, it's not feasible. Uh, how much experience do uh, the fresh undergrads uh, have once they start, and uh, how many of them? Well, our, our enrollments are really, really small. We are a third of what we were three years ago. So why would you say? I think that students are afraid they can't get a job, which is kind of ironic because we've also, this year we have many, many employers contacting us now. I mean, I had someone email me in August looking for somebody, and I have a student who's a senior who's being recruited by a company that wants him to sign now, even though he's not going to graduate until June. I mean, there's a, a lot out there right now, but that's not the perception due to a lot of the media focus in the last couple of years on outsourcing. There isn't an awareness that for every job outsourced, there's another, I don't know, four or five being created. So that, uh, oh, so what was your original question? Was that your question? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good answer, but it's not, it's not that. Oh, so what they have when they come in, there's a wide variety. Some students come in having taken uh, C it's, uh, computer science in high school. Usually they've taken a Java course and then taken the AP exam. And uh, frequently they repeat the intro courses. Um, or they, they get to skip one course. Uh, some students come in having done um, a little stuff on their own, whether it's Python or Ruby on Rails or Visual Basic. Uh, some students come in with nothing but uh, working on the web. Um, but you know, you don't, it's very uncommon now to see a student who truly has no background um, in uh, or no exposure to computers, computer science. What kind of math skills do you see coming Oh, that's, that's a pet, no pet view of mine. I'll get that in a later talk. Okay. Okay. I want to turn you into activists, right? Okay, so um, let me just go through quickly the personal characteristics, and I'm sure you're all familiar with these since you're all professionals. And um, this is kind of a summary I've developed over the years, and I, I have, like, you know, I worked briefly before I went graduate school. But I also have several friends um, who work in the industry and you know we speak frequently and um, actually a couple of employees and students that have graduated um, from our program. Um, the thing I want to emphasize from the start is that a lot of personal characteristics that make a student successful in taking courses and getting A's are not the characteristics that make them successful once they get out. So I think what's very important is to have a love of learning and not to lose it. Okay? And someone who really wants to stay on top of things and who's always reading or talking with other people um, is, is going to be successful. Uh, they, they don't wait for someone to come to them and say, you know, hey, hey, you look at this. They're they're out there seeing what's interesting in this um, So it's, you know, students who are curious, they want to know how things work. Uh, they want to know how the compiler does that, or where that's stored in memory, or how is that optimized, when it's optimized. Um, a student who can identify patterns. I don't, I don't mean design patterns here. I just mean common um, uh, reoccurring uh, solutions or processes. Right? And also, this gets back to your math question, uh, students are analytical. Right? They can look at things critically and evaluate you know, what's, what's the benefit, what's, what's the cost, where can I go from here, okay? Um, and that's not the same as an A, okay? Okay. Uh, someone who is egalitarian, uh, you know, Frederick Brooks, Frederick Brooks, the no silver bullet idea, right? Uh, you don't really want fanatics. Fanatics are, are, are closed in. Um, I keep in touch with a fair number of students and I know some really bright uh, graduates who are now essentially working alone because they have just become wedded to a particular way of doing things using a particular platform or 
a particular tool and they're they're kind of limited, right? It's a very narrow focus. Uh, and for this reason, I think it's important for departments to give students a exposure to different languages and different platforms and different tools. Okay. Um, students who are independent, I mean, let's face it, computer science is a hands-on discipline, right? And you can't sit down and compile tests and run things yourself. You're, you're sort of in trouble, okay? Uh, and I, I actually I had a conversation with a student today who told me that we do far too much software engineering. And I said, well, what do you mean? We, we, you haven't taken any software engineering courses yet. We're doing software design. He said, oh, well, it's just, it's just too much programming. I want to do some more math. Um, uh, so, and so this is a, is a student who can uh, seek answers online and uh, look at references, do some independent reading, uh, develop samples learn. Now, that doesn't mean <laughs> someone who never confers with anyone else. Okay? Uh, because you actually want someone who's collaborative, someone who asks for help when necessary, right? and someone who's willing to help others. So it's actually very interesting. Over the course of teaching, I've noticed that students who come to my office hours, um, the reasons why they come span the spectrum. Okay? If a student just comes to find out why they missed five points on this test, and once I tell them why and they can't get the points back, they leave, right? That tells me something different than a student who comes and wants to talk about the concepts behind the question, or what were the related concepts, or what what else can we learn about the subject area, or you know what's going on in computer science. Uh, someone who is not totally motivated by the grade reward uh, tends to be uh, a more independent, more interested in learning for for learning's sake, and to view programming as an intellectual process, not just something to get through to get a degree. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think balance is really, really important, because if you look at independence and collaboration, there are two different sides, right? Okay, you can have someone who's completely independent, and that's really too much, because then you have the lone ranger, and that's not someone who can work with others. And I think the days of working solely on your own are pretty much over, unless you become a consultant, which is hard to get you first get out. And even if you become a consultant, you still have to work with others. Um, but on the other hand, if you staff someone who can't ever answer something themselves, right, who always has to go to the guy next door and ask why this doesn't work, then you have someone who is not enough of a long ranger and becomes kind of a pest. Sure, they are able to achieve a balance more easily. Okay? Many students, when they come in, are completely independent. They will never go, go to your office hours and will not work anyone else because they know how to do it and they can be very successful. And this, this is usually true for, the, for at least the initial part of the curriculum. Right? Um, but then later on, they have to be collaborative. That's what, one of the plugs that we talked about next. Why was creativity not on your list? Oh, that's a good one. That should be on there. You're right. That should be on there. I, I guess you could put it under level learning or creative process. But that's, that's more analytical, but you know, I'm talking about synthesis. Like, uh, yeah. No, that is, a, that is an essential portion of it. And it has to be kind of connected with the ability to, to evaluate the product of your creativity. Yeah? I'm going back to the first of those two slides. Um, do you think that there's a meaningful tension, I guess, between the, the desire to um, to, to uh, identify identify patterns, I suppose, and find um, interesting interesting ways to sort of generalize and you know find new ways to use the same tools. And I mean, I find that I fall in love with tools because then you know, like Siemens plus the language in particular, because it's so general purpose, and you can find so many ways to do things with it. But that's sort of contrary to not being wedded to a single language. You know, finding all the interesting ways to use the one thing. You know, you're not necessarily looking at all the, you know, the, the, the Java's and the Pythons and whatever's in the world. 
No, but you're probably aware of them, and you know how the, how they perform or how you play with them relative to what you're using, right? Um, what, when you talk about a fanatic, this is a person who says, uh, you know, this language, C sharp or Java or C plus plus or Python is the language. You know, we should use it for everything, right? You can do everything in Python, right? Uh, and al although, you know, for some applications it is true you can implement them in a variety of, of languages, the performance can vastly differ, right? Um, so I want to go to my plugs, right? First one is a senior capstone project. Um, we started doing this about 10 years ago at Seattle University. And what this is, is a requirement for all of our CS students. And, it, and unless you're taking a minor in CS, you're required to the senior product. It was a year-long project. Um, and the goal of this is really to uh, integrate a lot of the concepts that the student have been studying for, four, for for three years prior to entry of the, the project. Um, and this is sponsored by industry. There's a, there's a CLU project center. And they solicit product from different companies. So three years ago I had a product with Microsoft. Two years ago I had one with uh, uh, Boeing. Last year was Adobe. Um, this year's another one Boeing, work with small companies. And what happens is that the students are divided up into groups of four and six, group of four and six students, and they're assigned a technical liaison from the company that sponsored the project, and then they're also assigned a faculty advisor. And so they spend the full academic year developing a, a product. And sometimes it's actually a usable product. So my Adobe team last year developed something for Adobe's Jam Jars, actually used on the site now. Um, uh, more common is uh, the development of prototypes. Uh, it's very interesting, several years ago did a product for Boeing, and they essentially had a political impasse in how to uh, migrate uh, a set of machines in terms of where to go. So the students did prototypes of uh, um, smaller systems to, to show the um, performance on a small scale. And this allowed the engineers of Boeing to evaluate the prototype and decide what to do. Right? Uh, eight years ago, I did a project uh, comparing C++ to Java, where the students essentially implemented small-scale versions of what was desired and then did performance evaluations. And it really happened here that the C++ one was much more efficient, and that's what we have doing it. Um, so the nice thing about this requirement is it forces students to work on something for which they're really held accountable, right? Because they actually have to give a product to the sponsor at the end of the year, okay? They have a technical liaison which they meet with regularly. They get exposed to the real world, right? And they don't have a course that simply ends after the final, it goes on for the whole year, right? And the uh, more traditional software development projects, they go through requirements analysis and design uh, reviews before they actually get the implementation. Um, unfortunately, the school year is not long enough to actually do some significant testing on any of these products and unless you already have through the company uh, uh, some of the requirements already nailed down. So if any of you work for companies where you're interested in mentoring young students, then send me an email and I'll put you in touch with the project coordinator and I want to talk about um, hospice study the project. Yeah. And actually this is this is where you discover the students who will become successful and the students who won't work won't. So the faculty get together the spring before the senior project begins and they get the list of seniors who are qualified, student, rising seniors current juniors who qualify for student product. They have to take certain directives. They have to take a software design course. They have to take database. They have to take uh, albums. And they have to take um, programming languages. Okay? And that's to ensure that everyone coming in has a broad enough exposure that they can uh, successfully complete whatever product they're given, whether it's a web design 
project, whether it's a database project, whether it's a, um, a profiling project or something. Right? And so the, the faculty, we distribute the students, you guys may not know this, but we make sure that each student has a strong, each team has a strong student, so that, or one more strong student, so that the project is successful. But a strong student is not necessarily a student that has the highest GPA, right? Because there are many students with high GPAs who just don't have the characteristics we just previously talked about, right? They're either lone rangers, or they really only do things for the A, and they don't really want to do anything extra, um, or they haven't been able to manage their time successfully to really work on something long term. Uh, yeah? Have any of your students gotten involved with the Google Summer Code? No, not that I know of. Because it, it reminds me an awful lot of the way you described the cash flow project. There are a lot of open source projects that are uh, interested in soliciting help from students. That sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, one of our students did a project last summer, but it's actually with someone down in California. Uh, but it was the same thing, it was an open source thing. It, was, it wasn't Google, but that, that's a good idea. Uh, I think anything that gives students experience with something that's real is incredibly valuable for they to get out. And interestingly enough, I had students in their senior year come to me and say, I, I don't want to do this, right? And it's a little late because I had a graduate with CS degree, but they really learned this is not what they want to do. And uh, sometimes they go out, work for a couple of years, and change their minds, but oftentimes they, they change immediately. So one student applied to law school, it's uh, you know, very different, but it's what we do, okay? Okay, I was going to plug my book, but I'm such a natural salesman that I forgot to bring a copy of it. But um, I, I wrote this, it got published this summer. Um, what happened was I just got really frustrated with having to teach a lot of transfer students who came in knowing Java and who had difficulty learning C++ and who didn't value memory management because, well, Java has a garbage collector. Why do we even bother with this? Like, and, so the, the book is targeted at, you know, at experienced programmers who are learning C++. And unlike many of the texts that are traditionally used in academia, it goes into a discussion of background processes, much of what we covered earlier, and how the virtual function table is laid out, how binding uh, actually occurs, what is linking and loading, et cetera. Okay? But the general idea is that um, you should look for literature with analysis associated with it, not just you know how to learn C++ in seven days or 48 hours. <laughs> well, you, if you have someone who learns only the syntax of a language, um, their perspectives are very limited, and it's also difficult for them to continue educating themselves once they graduate. Okay. And the last plug is for K-12 math, okay? Um, I, it, this has been a pet peeve of mine for a long time. I don't know how many of you have kids, but if you don't have kids, you're gonna be working with people who if they were educated in the state, came to the K-12 system and got the exposure to math curriculum, which is currently constructivist. And this is where students are not taught albums any longer, they're taught and it, it's not just a concentration on the impetus, but um, they have to rediscover all the algorithmic processes on, on their own, which is a very time-consuming, frustrating process. Um, a few years ago, my daughter, who was in third grade and learning multiplication, uh, she had to multiply, it was uh, five times um, as some number of times, and so it was the five times, right? And so she had to draw monkey hands for every every multiple of five. And she got up to ten. She just, I really have to draw ten monkey hands. So you know, it's it's a it's not a good approach. And students who come into college now are have a much higher incidence of uh, remediation necessary for math. Now I bring this up for several reasons. One, because it affects me professionally. Because I. Uh, it's difficult to work with students who don't have those analytical skills, and if you teach math algorithmically early on, students get the reinforcement of those analytical skills, and also they're not turned off to analytical processes. Um, 
it's very hard for students to succeed if they go through the curriculum that doesn't expose them to an algorithmic approach. And this is actually politically a hot topic because Washington State is currently uh, has a committee called Washington Learns. I don't know if you've been following this in the news, but um, they're looking at um, like the K-12 system in this state, and uh, they're looking at the reason why half our students can't pass the 10th grade math fossil, even though the test is on an international level only 8th grade. Right? So there's this great uh, website, I'm not part of it, but it's a parent activist group that I believe is, is um, at the Kirkland, it's called Where's the Math? Right? And they give you lots of examples of what's wrong with the current curriculum. Um, and if you really are interested, I'd encourage you to write your legislator and uh, ask them to support a re-examination of the math curriculum and um, possibly change. An interesting note here is that Pearson Publishing Group uh, is the publishing company that sells the most textbooks in the most math textbooks in the state. And they're also contracted out to like Wassel. So that's to me a little conflict of interest. Um, so uh, this is my personal event, but it's shared by many others. And uh, I encourage you to look at that. Uh, okay. So I'll just close with, I want to thank several um, people that I keep in contact with. Uh, Roger Balls, the manager at Zilog. Uh, and he's employed some of our some of our graduates. And he really is in tune with um, what students know and what they don't know and what they need to know. And Robert Field is a guy I used to work with 20, 20 years ago. He's down in California as a software consultant. And he's the one who won't hire anyone who only has a job or background. Um, very novel. Tom Hildebrand is actually my husband. Um, he's a software consultant. Uh, and his background is in computer engineering, so he has a really strong hardware background and really concurs with uh, the emphasis on memory management and um, interface expectations and stuff. Okay. And then there are many, many students, three from here tonight, right? Um, so that's the essence of what I wanted to talk about. I'm happy to, to hear anything from you as to what you think is needed or what, what your observations are. Comments, yeah? I often have people ask me what they should study in college if they want to be a programmer, and I always tell them to study calculus. Yeah. But if you can master calculus, then the programming is it's just going to fall right into place for you. Um, that's a pertinent observation. A few years ago, we changed. Um, uh, we used to have calculus as a prerequisite to our CS1 course, and we changed it into a prerequisite because what we discovered is someone who cannot master um, calculus cannot really master uh, computer science. Uh, and it's not because calculus is really used directly, because it, you know you might see it in an algorithms course, you might see it in an operating system course, part of human theory, but really it's not used directly, but it, it's that analytical um, process that, that's reinforced. And as a side comment to that, um, because we see, we're seeing an increasing demand for students who want a softer CS because they're going to something that's not software dev. We're now looking at developing a CS0 course, I was just telling you this before the talk, using something like Alice, which is a graphical programming language that's kind of targeted toward high school kids, um, rather than a uh, um, declarative language. Right? And that, that course will not require calculus because it's targeted to a different set of students. So Walter, I think uh, not even calculus, algebra is what uh, the students should be learning. Uh, Andre and I had the good fortune of spending an evening with Alexander Stepanov. For those who don't know, he's the guy who wrote uh, the STL. And uh, he taught us all uh, about you know, his recommendations for uh, reading material. And it was um, uh, an algebra textbook from the 1800s by a guy named Crystal and uh, Euclid's Elements. Geometry and algebra is what CS students need to know. 
Well, the, the, you know, if a student cannot ma master algebra, right, they have, they cannot master abstraction. I mean, after all, what is what is the variable, right? Yeah. It's it's just a name for a memory location, and students have to be able to handle that level abstraction immediately. And if they can't, right, then they can't progress. Yeah. Right. David? Um, other than the capstone project, are there different things that you do within your classes to cultivate some of the, the traits you find, in, positive traits in, in software developers? Um, well, personally, I have started to move in a direction where um, when I'm teaching programming or software design, I have students evaluate their design. So it's not not sufficient for them just to program up a solution and to marginally document according to standards, but they actually have to understand why they chose to do what they did, right? And I think that's a that's somewhat effective in get, getting students to think about different approaches. Um, uh, I always talk about background processes, and since I'm the um, most senior person in the department now, Everyone else has uh, left for other pastures. Um, uh, I have a broader view of the curriculum than some of the other faculty, so I know what the holes are, and so I'm able to insert that stuff into the courses I teach to try and patch up those holes. It is somewhat difficult, though, because we have so many different tracks. So even though our CS majors on the general track will get exposure to um, most of the the building blocks, someone on a business track or someone getting a BA might not. Do you see a lot of other disciplines um, asking um, about introducing computational approaches into their curriculum and their model program? Uh, no, I think and that depends upon the academic institute you're at. So if you're at an institute where you're tuition funded, then departments are very territorial over credits because they want the students in their seats, right? So it's more common that a, that a, a discipline will teach their own computational course tailored specifically toward their needs. So physics might teach MATLAB, um, mechanical engineering might teach Fortran. Uh, it's, um, personally, they, I think that there should be a more uniform approach Electrical engineering has, in math, just required their majors to take a CS course so that they get a, a more general introduction than a very specific tool. What about the social science? Uh, I would love to have that as a requirement, but it's currently not. Um, there are some CS literacy courses that are offered, but they don't really involve programming. Yeah, um, yeah I, I had, I guess, the equivalent years ago for a professor at Princeton who was um, trying to figure out what the department could be a science of Princeton to be doing. And uh, his talk was very different from yours. Um, and uh, rather than deal with the specific little details of this, that, and the other, <coughs> his thought was that computers really uh, are useful not just as an intrinsic thing, but as something that does something for something else. So his, his concept was to combine, you know, computers courses with the math department, computer courses with the music department, computer courses with the archaeology department, I mean any department at the university in Trail, sort of make the computer department the sort of hub of a series of spokes, um, rather than concentrate on, you know, the actual nuts and nuts and bolts of computers. And I and say the last question reflected slightly on that, but uh, yeah, and I think actually that, that is a direction that is probably um, a good one to take. Uh, the only way we've done it currently is we have a web design course that interacts with the um, humanities, basically, because you're, it's based upon the notion of uh, human computer interface. Uh, and that draws in a lot of, of non-majors. It's, it's, it can be difficult, though, to introduce a class that isn't required by somebody in some place and get the moment sufficient to sustain it. Um, 
But there, there's even more overlap now than there was just a couple of years ago. Yeah? Uh, so do you ever run into, I mean, sort of as, a, as an alternative to that, I mean, do you ever hear people sort of arguing that, um, like sort of like, I think it was Dr. who said computers are no more, our computer science is no more about computers than astronomy about telescopes. Mm -hmm. Like that, that like, you know, computer science should be more about like the, the complexity theory and, and you know, the halting problem and all this sort of theoretical stuff. I mean, obviously that's not like where all the jobs are. So, I mean, is there ever sort of, do you ever see sort of a tension between people who are more all about the theory and thinking that computer science should be about that? Occasionally, less so now than previously. Um, and. Uh, it really is too bad in a way that, that students can come out with really almost no knowledge of computational complexity. Uh, but you know, if you have a limited number of credits, you have to make some choices, and um, a lot of departments are moving away from the theory uh, because it doesn't sustain the career orientation that many students have. Yeah? And maybe we want to is I've a lot of reasons to sort of agree with, with uh, Mr. Field, you know, maybe that's the Java only candidates and they're not very smart candidates. I mean, they, especially, you see people who have been, I mean, who are in fact much senior to myself, you know, I see people who've got 10, 20 years of extra experience, and it's it's plain to me, two things are very clear to me. One is that they've been doing basically fine, doing good jobs at where they've been. And it's equally clear to me that there's no possible way I can hire them. So I mean, there's, there's different levels of, you know, how demanding the job is, and I wonder whether I mean, it seems like there's, I tend to describe a sort of schism between like applications development and systems development. You can characterize it how you like. But I wonder whether, you know, the things that you look for, the things that you target, especially as more and more career paths are integrated, more and more RT assets, <coughs> it, whether it's it's simply, you know, the, the more classical computer science curriculum that, you know, as purists we, we know and love is simply an appropriate voice on the masses, as it were. You know, I mean, it's, it's a sort of almost elitist, uh, Perspective, but it's, I mean, it's, that seems to be borne out by, by what you see on the ground. Yeah, it's, it's actually a very difficult problem, and we're struggling with how to address it because the demand is out there, but it's not a demand for the traditional CS degree. And just what you structure to give students what they, the foundation that can be beneficial to them once they get out, <coughs> is what we're trying to figure out. I mean, it seems like it's a bit for, for to have a class of students who are going off in two different directions to simplify it even that much. It's this service to both the cool the cool ones classes, you know, because you're teaching to the middle and neither one is really there. Um, yeah, but you, you kind of have to teach the middle. And this is why a dependence on uh, students who are willing to take responsibility for their own education is, you know, essential for success uh, because you, you can't cover everything so you have to rely on a student to move further along that path that you have started them on. I mean is somebody who's going to just go and write applications in Java and never really have cause to, I mean if, if they took your class and, and learned all about memory management but never really needed that information, it's not It's not about, you know, did, was, was the level of Know, the difficulty of the course you hire is just wasn't focused correctly for what they eventually need in their career. But if even some, if, if someone only goes into one area, though, if they have knowledge of um, criteria that are applicable to other areas, I think that that they're they're farther ahead. I mean, someone who just does Java Java applications but knows that perhaps it's not the best solution for everything is going to be much better off than someone who believes that Java is the answer for everything. But at the time that you were teaching them. The, about memory, we're not teaching them about something else. Right, but but what what the desire would be is to teach more syntax, right? Because that's that's the pressure. The pressure is to teach something that can be immediately usable, which is a tool, which is basically a syntactical or skill based approach, and that has limited utility because most tools have limited lifetimes, and students have to learn how to use them themselves. Yeah. Kind of a fall into those. Is there pressure amongst universities to diversify computer science? I mean, engineering, very few schools have one engineering degree program. You know, there's electrical, there's computer, there's mechanical, you know, the list goes on and they separate it out into various different degrees. How long is it going to be before computer science starts differentiating out into, I don't know, maybe 
Well, I think that's why I mean, no, I, I think there are, there are now uh, CS tracks that are IT, for example, versus CS tracks that are general. There are CS tracks that, that are set up for channel people into bioinformatics. Right? They're, they're, that diversification has begun, but the question is how successful can you do that at every institution? So bioinformatics, for example, not only requires a biology background, but it requires a really strong math background. And you're not going to get that in all students. Diversification for integration of different theoretical backgrounds is one thing, but it seems like we're in danger of, of degenerating into a trade school education here. Uh, you know, people can, can graduate with a degree in computer science who effectively only know how to operate certain pieces of software. Uh, granted, that, that piece of software might be something quite like a language, but it's still not entirely the same, I mean, especially with IDE experiences being what they are. People can graduate, you know, being able to, to whiz around in Java or C sharp, but without the IDE support, they're completely dead in the water. I agree absolutely. That's uh, a very yeah. real concern. I, I, I my background is artificial intelligence, so you know, when I'm, when I'm on interview loops, a lot of times I'm the guy who's supposed to be probing people about their understanding of algorithms. And I can't tell you the number of times, you know, I'd say, well, I'm here to evaluate your understanding of algorithms, and I get an answer like, oh yeah, I, I hated that course. <sighs> And I don't even know where to begin being offended by that stage. <laughs> so, I guess what you, I, I can see having a background in software engineering being a separate thing. You know, if you want to be a workaday programmer who's not terribly troubled by how things work, it's a little bit like being a bus driver. You don't have to know how to build the bus to know your way around town. But it seems like we at least have to make a distinction between software engineering and computer science. If you're not going to have any theoretical background at all, or, or precious little, then I don't see how it can be a science degree. Yeah, and you also have to be very careful at looking at what what background the student has coming out of the program they were in. Did they get exposure to a variety of languages and end tools? Um, I mean, so one of the struggles we had a few years ago was forcing our students to use Unix, right? Because the response was. I want to use Visual C++. I have the IDE there for me. It's nice, you know, it's much better. Why can't I use it? Well, that's true. And, and the response was you need to learn different different ways of doing things. So, uh, yeah, you, know, but you, you definitely should be pushing the Microsoft product. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I kind of object to the characterization that, you know, engineering, they don't know the theory or don't need the theory. I kind of see the difference between science and engineering as, a scientist does research, and an engineer builds applications, but they both know the theory. I, I that, That's a point well taken. I think, though, that if I'm a hiring manager and I have to have some way to, to separate the sheep from the goats, you know, if I'm building, even if I'm working in a department here like, you know, office where I'm building features, and I need people to work on feature crews, that, that's sort of one level of understanding. But if, if it doesn't have to be MSR, you know, even in my own group, in, in the, the compiler group, it's really not acceptable to hire somebody who could, you know, slap together a really good Java applet, you know, because you well, really have to have a deeper understanding of what's but, going But I, I would say that a technician is one who knows how to build things without understanding the theory. Mm -hmm. An engineer knows how to build something and he knows the theory, and a scientist does research building new theories. Okay, so let, let me weigh in from, a, from an academic perspective. The, the difficulty with having engineers teach programming is because that's all they're teaching. They're teaching how to solve problems in a particular language. And they may not be giving the students enough background to really understand what it is they're doing and the consequences of their design choices. So you may have students coming out saying, you know, hey, I took this one course. I mean, I, I, I used to work back east in Pennsylvania. I worked in the department that was electrical engineering and computer science. And even though my, my husband's an E person, I've been exposed to a lot of engineers, there were some faculty who were very hostile to CS. And I had a faculty member come to tell me, well, what do you do with all your time? You know, I mean, once you learn Fortran, what else is there? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, it's difficult for a specialty that's outside computer science to give students the breadth that I think a, a generalist should have in CS. So, Scott, you had a question? 
But well, while I had a comment about this, it, it seems like there's some, some pressure coming back from the industry, though, to see people educated when they get spit out of college with their tool and their, we want you to know this, we want you to know this, we want, and, and I see academia kind of re reacting to that by saying, oh, there's an interest in C++, let's teach everyone C++, or, or at, the at the community college level, we'll teach this one language, we'll teach this language. And um, I mean, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an experienced, uh, I'm an ex-Microsoft employee who's going back to school now. And uh, I think it's Im important for, for the academia to, to stay very generalized and, the, 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 and stay in the theory and stay, stay in the science of it, where you're talking about. Um, but the, the, the industry isn't picking up a lot of the responsibility of teaching the specific tools and the, 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 very, the very specifics they're looking for. And in fact, they're forcing that down and forcing lack of, and, and taking time where students would be learning the theory and replacing it with. But now I mean, these tools, I mean, you know, from perhaps from your experience here, I and mean, I can certainly speak for Microsoft in this respect. I think Microsoft does have a, a good system for taking people out of college and and sort of starting them in that sort of apprenticeship phase. And if you're done with your academic studies, and now we're going to bring you up to speed on our specific ways of doing it. Sort of like law school. And you can learn the law, but that doesn't teach you courtroom procedure. You've got to go actually figure it out. And, and Actually, this portion of the discussion is very interesting because one of my friends who has worked for a number of startups um, has, has said to me that he doesn't know how fresh graduates do it anymore because every place he's worked in the last eight years, he said there's no room for someone entry level. Uh, everyone wants someone who's experienced, uh, who can come on the job and do something immediately. It's so funny, it seems to have inverted. You know, in the old days, small companies and startups you know, were hungry. They were, that's where a place where somebody new in the field could get their toehold. And now it's the other way around. You know, it's a big company where you can incubate people. And you know, small companies need people who can hit the ground running. And the discerning student knows that, because the discerning student knows that they should go and work for a company, big or small, that's going to support them and their career. So you know, I, I, I tell them to look for companies that support further education that will pay for, um, you know, whether it's a formal degree or whether it's sending you to a conference or whether it's a workshop, someone who's going to help you stay educated, right? Um, someone who has a, a little more interest in you long term than rather than, you know, using language A on platform B to solve problem C right now. Okay. And so the discerning students will pick that up. <coughs> I noticed an interesting thing when I was in college that the best, some of the very best programmers had actually never taken a CS course. They were physics majors. Yeah. And I, I just found that very interesting how something about physics and programming goes together. That if you, because the top physicists always seem to be, you know, some of the best programmers out there. And I don't really know why that's true. I'm wondering if you've seen anything like that. No, but I know some physics physicists who are good programmers. I think it's a an appreciation for the hardware system on which the software rests and a willingness to um, educate themselves on how that works <coughs> and then couple that with uh, some software. I think it's also probably a desire to understand the why and the how more than just trying to crank, you know, in physics you really get into why the world works the way it works. The sort of a natural fit. I think you can generalize it, though. I mean, certainly some of the best programmers I know have been, you know, people with other engineering backgrounds or other physics backgrounds, but also um, linguists, biologists, you know, you know, even just creative writers. I know several who are very good programmers, and it seems to be just a matter of the ability to appeal to your your, your higher cognitive functions in one form or another. If you're good at anything, then you probably are good at explaining it. And explaining things in a rational way is really what programming is, you know, and that's that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, and, and really a, a dedication to always learning. I mean, that's one of the nicest things about uh, teaching CS is that uh, you know it's, it's very <coughs> easy to incorporate um, new ideas or new approaches. Or it's, it's not 